Yeah. Okay. All right. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the offline part of the day. Um, so my kind of involvement with the, all the offline stuff started a year and a half ago when I joined Lanyard. And when I joined Lanyard, Mike, you're saying close to Mike. Uh, just speak louder. Oh, speak louder. Okay. okay, right. So, <laughs> can everyone hear me? Yeah. Right, okay, I'll stay at this level. So, a year and a half ago, I started at Lanyard. When I started, they were building uh, an iPhone app. And they were doing this mainly just to kind of get a presence in the App Store, um, but also because it, it gave them the opportunity to make uh, data available offline. And offline is important to conference delegates because you're quite often on a plane on the way there, so you've you know, mostly got no connection there. Or when you arrive in a foreign country, you might be data roaming, so you know, we don't want you to have to, to, to pay a lot of money just to find out you know, where the conference is or what the sessions are. And even when you're at the conference, uh, I mean, obviously, conferences have, have Wi-Fi, but it's a special brand of Wi-Fi known as conference Wi-Fi, which is like Wi-Fi, but it doesn't work. So you can't rely on the connection. But obviously, not everyone has an iPhone. People have you know, lots of different kind of devices, and we wanted Lanyard to work on there as well. Uh, but uh, you know, most of these don't, well, quite a few of these don't have a, an app platform, and we didn't have the resource to go and build apps for all of them either. So we wanted to make a, a, a web version of the app, and that was what I was there to do. And when I was uh, given this task, I was like, well, I really want to work, make offline work uh, in the web version as well. And I had this recollection of this thing called App Cache. And I went and did some preliminary research into it. And it, it looked really good. You know, I could just add a, a reference to a, a, a manifest on the, the HTML element. And then I could just list all of the stuff that I want to work offline. Uh, and, it, and it works. And, and I can also capture a set of URLs, like everything that um, begins with avatars, images, avatars, and then say, well, if you're offline, I want you to serve that instead. And I was like, wow, this, this sounds like a really good solution. It, it seemed like the, you know, the API was this big, cuddly teddy bear, and it was going to, and I kind of ran up and I hugged the teddy bear and thought, together, we're going to get through this. We can make the web work offline. Of course, it soon became obvious that the lovely teddy bear that I was cuddling was filled with razor blades and bees. <laughs> <laughs> and I got stung many, many times. And, the razor blades dug into my skin, and I got the whole alphabet of hepatitis, and it was a really nasty experience. So you hear the word gotcha a lot with, uh, with app cache, and the spec does seem to do uh, the unexpected. I think your mic is on. Oh, yeah, that, that would help. OK. Oh, oh that's nice, sir. OK. Um, so when something is cached, it will always come from the cache. You know, if, if the app cache has something to give you, it will serve it straight from the cache. And that's, so even if you're online, you're going to get those cached assets. And, uh, and the cache is only updated if, a, if the manifest file itself changes, like just a character changes, even if that character is inside a comment. Um, and the cache only updates if all of the things you listed download successfully. If one of them 404s or 500s, then uh, the whole sort of thing fails. I started drawing this, this diagram to try and make sense of what AppCache was, was actually doing, what the flow of information was, how it worked. And this is how I you know, did some talks based on this, and I was showing this diagram going, look, look how terrible AppCache is, look how complicated it is. And, but if you think about some code you've written recently, even something fairly simple, like, I don't know, uh, form validation, if you drew it as a flow chart, it would look like this. It would look this complicated, probably more complicated. And that doesn't make it wrong, and that doesn't make it difficult to read, and that doesn't make it hard to maintain. A lot of the gotchas that AppCache has are actually quite sensible. I, so the cache is used even if you're online, and that happens because it's really, really fast. The exception is in fallback. So you know, if it tries to request an avatar, it's going to go to the network, and it's only going to serve this if the network request fails. And that's really quick in this case. Because you can go and get the avatar from the network, and that's going to be really fast. It's even faster in this case, because it's going to fail really, really quickly, and you'll get the fallback avatar instead. The problem case is this, which I like to call the real world. And when your phone's in this kind of state, it's like, um, it's like a one-legged dog. It, it thinks it can still play fetch, but it can't. And, and you have to sort of watch it drag itself along the floor with its, with its one leg. And it's heartbreaking. And it's, with your phone, it's really, really irritating because you know that on the device, on there, is the data that is good enough for you right now, but it won't give you it. It has to wait for minutes before it decides it you know, really can't make this connection. 
The spec doesn't really mention offline very much. It only talks about connections that succeeded or failed, all past tense. It doesn't kind of try and predict uh, the state of the network. So cache data first is good, because it doesn't have any uh, kind of expectation of the network. That's great. And this is how apps behave. If you open Twitter on your phone, you've got old data there, and then it goes and fetches new data if it can, if there's a network uh, connection. So if complexity isn't the problem here, what is the problem? Well, what's the app cache made of? There's a request cache, and we can add, remove, and update items from this. And those updates are transactional. It's all atomic. And it's kind of pretty sensible. There's also a router. You know, the router takes a network connection and decides if, you know, what it should do with it. And it, so it can just serve stuff straight from the cache without going to the network. Or it can you know, go to the network, give that a go, and serve something from the cache if that fails. And that's all quite sensible as well. But what's our API into this? Our API is the manifest. So if I do this, I add an empty manifest file, well, just with the words cache manifest. What this will do is it will take index.html and it will put that into the cache. And it will set up a routing rule that says, if that page is requested, serve it straight from the cache. Really? Did I just tell it to do all that just with this empty file? Here I'm adding a lot more static routes. And here I'm saying, hey, with this one line, take fallback PNG, make that a cache entry, put that into the cache. And if any of these URLs are requested, set up a, a routing rule, try and fetch it from the network first. And if that fails, then use this instead, fallback PNG. And a failure means any you know, HTTP status code that starts with 4, 404, anything that starts with 5, or if there's a redirect to another domain. Did I really tell it to do that with this one line? There's a lot of assumptions to make. Oh, and if I say, have just on my HTML page, a link, okay, well, an image to a picture of, I don't know, your cat from Flickr. Do you have a cat? Who has a cat? Your cat, good, Bruce's cat. What happens, what happens to that cat, the image of that cat? Okay, so our index HTML file is a get request, that's fine. Um, is it associated for manifest? Yes, it is. We're going to use that. Is the URL app cached? Yes, it is. So it comes straight from the cache. That's fine. Is it HTML? Yes, it is. So for each GET request on the page, we're going to go back up here, and that's going to include the picture of your cat. So is the URL app cached? No. Is the URL in the network section of the manifest? Uh, no. Does the URL match a fallback prefix? No. We've got one for avatars, but not one for Bruce's cat, so no. Is there a star in the network section? No. So the image will fail, and the picture of Bruce's cat will not appear. It will appear as if there was no network. Even if you're online, the picture of that cat will fail to download. There is nothing here, to me, that suggests that pictures of Bruce's cat should not load. I don't know what the app cache has against Bruce's cat, but even online, it's not going to work. This is a downfall API. And by downfall, I don't mean the shouty Hitler uh, thing. I'm not suggesting app caches like Hitler, although it, it is a bit. But no, I mean the old board game. I don't know how many people have played this, but this is what I feel like when I'm dealing with app cache. You know, I know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get my pieces to the bottom. And I have a very limited set of controls for that. But when I'm doing this, all kinds of shit's happening in the background. And I don't know what's going on until bits start falling out of the bottom that I didn't expect. And I don't know which of my actions actually contributed to that happening. Yeah, I know the last one that happened, but I don't know everything that happened before that. The manifest is simple in terms of a character count, but there's too much implicit going on here. A better API may involve more typing, but might set out exactly what's uh, supposed to happen. What if, in your HTML, you could say, I want to register a JavaScript controller. I'm going to capture, this, this controller is going to take care of all URLs um, on the origin, just slash star. And here's my JavaScript file. And that was going to run in some kind of worker. And here I could just say, so for all of these files, um, when the cache is supposed to update itself, I want you to define a cache called static. And I want you to cache all of those static URLs and do it atomically. And then on, when there's a request, I want you to have a look and see in the static cache if there's something that matches the incoming URL. And if there is a resource, prevent default, you know, don't do the default browser action, respond with that resource from the cache. This is a lot more typing than the equivalent in, in the manifest, you know, that you do in a manifest, but it's, it's really explicit. You're setting out exactly what you, what you want to happen. There's no magic here. You can bring, 
You can, you can define your own magic. This is a bring your own unicorn API. You, know, you, can, you can do all of that stuff yourself. What if I could say, OK, I'm going to set up a route for get requests, anything that you know, starts with avatars, prevent the default. I want you to try and get it from the network. But on an error, I want you to see if we've got something, uh, the fallback PNG in the resource. And if there is, I'm going to serve it. So that's the equivalent of your fallback, but you're telling it exactly what to do. What if I could listen to messages from the, uh, the web page that's, that's happening? So imagine something like the FT where there's issues and the user might have said, I want to cache this, is this issue. So we'd post a message saying, cache the issue. And when that, we receive that, cache is defined, issue, and then the issue number and the URLs to cache for that. And then when those requests come in, anything that's you know, URL, issue, and then number, we're going to deal with that. We're going to say, get me the cache for that issue. If we have that cached and we have a URL inside that cache that matches what's being requested, serve it. Otherwise, if the request type is a navigate, as in someone is changing page, it's going to be a full reload, prevent the default, respond, try and, try and um, fetch it from the network as normal. And if that fails and the status code was zero, which suggests a lack of network connection, then serve a thing from the cache saying, no, I'm afraid you don't have that issue cached. Here's why. And that's something we can't do with app cache now. Maybe you could do stuff like get stuff from local storage um, and then use Mustache to render it, or whatever templating language you included. We could just you know, completely build an app up from this experience and completely define how it should behave. So even someone who is unfamiliar with the API would have a good idea of what it's doing. They wouldn't have to read a whole spec to understand what's going on. What if we could do that? And I think that's what we're going to discuss, or things around it. This is the, I don't know how this transition. Yeah, the clap. So what? Budge up, budge up. I think that's Andrew's seat, isn't it? Okay. Right. Um, so I, I realized. Um, when Jake started that I completely forgot to big up all the people on the panel before um, we started. So we have uh, Jake, who's uh, obviously just given his, uh, his talk, who's now developer relations for Google, formerly from Lanyard. Um, Mark Christian from Twitter, who also created um, one of the first informative sites about AppCache, appcachefacts.info. Alex Russell, um, also from Google, who um, is co-author of the, um, the proposal that Jake was just talking about with the navigation controller. Um, and Jonah Sicking from um, Mozilla, who has very kindly signed up at the very last minute to replace Le Toby Langle, who's unfortunately unable to make it because he's ill. So let's get started. So we have loads of questions in moderator about offline. And I think the. The most burning one for me, and I think the, the one that's most relevant to the FT is, why is, there such a, why is there such a constraint on what we can do offline? Why do we have such tiny limits on what we can store? And you know, is this a problem that we need to solve at the spec level, or um, is, do we need an entirely new technology to solve it? Jake, why don't you start? Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> Well, so if you're building something, it's going to be running on multiple devices, right? So you can't make too many expectations of the, uh, the, the kind of amount of data you would be able to store on a particular device. That said, one of the things we are looking at is the ability to, to request a, a, a permanent uh, cache. Because the current, one of the problems we've got with the current cache is um, the browser may eject it at any point. Is my microphone going off again? Oh, well. So the browser can like, just get rid of it at any point. Oh, hello. Huh. <laughs> it, um, so it, it, what the, the app cache gives you is it says like, one of these assets is not going to be ejected from the cache. If, if anything's going to be ejected, they're all going to be ejected together. And the spec doesn't say that you know, this stuff's going to be around forever. But, so the idea is if we could like, make a, a, where you would request a permanent cache, maybe of a particular size, um, then you, you, could, you could do that. And, that. and because the user would agree to, to give you that, they are also now in control of sort of uninstalling something. So if there is a lack of space, like they, they run out of space on their phone, then it's kind of down to them to decide what to keep and, and what to lose. So they might go and say, oh, well, 
this, this small FT app is very important to me, whereas these big game apps are not, and it's their decision of, of what so to lose. What's the, what's, the most, what's the sort of limit on what's reasonable? I mean, what, what's reasonable for an app to claim for its own exclusive use? How is that a question for the app to answer? Um, it's usually a question for the user to answer, right? I mean, this is about the user agent mediating the conversation between the app developer and the user who is the owner of the device. And so you're trying to enable that conversation to happen in an informed way. Um, and usually that doesn't mean, can I have some bit of storage? It's usually, did I mean to install this thing? Did I mean to turn this into a real thing that's not an ephemeral page that I happen to load and unload, right? The question is, have my expectations been violated by, by navigating naked to a web page? Did that imply that 100 megabytes was taken on disk? per page, right? Um, if I'm going to Facebook every day, maybe it does. Maybe that's a reasonable thing to do. If I go to Twitter and I'd like to see all my history, maybe that's the most reasonable thing I can possibly imagine. But that's a decision that I, as a user, should be at least part of. And so today, we don't have that way to mediate it. And so I think there's, no, at least in the, there was an additional proposal um, uh, yesterday that uh, Jonas and uh, others in Mozilla are working on to sort of layer on top of this API that we sort of have, uh, I guess, shown a little bit of um, the idea of a more declarative manifest that has more, um, I think, more to say about what the thing is that you would take an action on. Yeah, so there's, there's, a few, there's a few things here that the, uh, the ability, first of all, like we should, we should think of the web as being different from native applications. Like native applications, once you install a native application, it can sort of write as much as it wants. Like why, why should the web not be able to do that, assuming the user is fine with it? So we need to have some way of Communicating to the user between the between the application and the user um, uh, that the user thinks this this website is important and then wants to enable wants to enable it to store data on on the on the local device. Um, so so um, that that is really something uh, we, we need to enable. Uh, Google actually has some interesting ideas here in the in the file system API where they have this concept of. Uh, temporary storage and permanent storage. That concept is something we're working on expanding. So you can use that storage area to store essentially anything that you store locally. You can choose if it should be stored permanently or temporary. Um, and the user can then be involved and we can you know, also use heuristics uh, in the browser. Like if, if, if we know that the user is using websites a lot, we can grant that website more implicit storage and we can be more careful about uh, when we eject that data. Uh, or we can also enable the website to say, I want to really lock this down, and then the user, once the user is okay with that, we can guarantee that certain data is, is available offline. So like, the goal should really be that, that anything that native applications can do when it comes to storing data locally, the web should be able to do too. And, and that shouldn't be hard to, to accomplish. Is, 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 this, is it currently a problem that, that a user giving explicit consent to store something is there's an explicit um, intention to store, but then the browser can implicitly purge it. Is that, is that a bug, do you think, currently in implementation? Should, we have, should it be the case that anything that's explicitly given permission to, to be stored should be explicitly removed by the user? I mean, I, I, think, I think we need, um, we need to enable the scenario where you're sort of guaranteed that something is around. And the, the only way to guarantee that something is around is, is to uh, uh, to take up storage on the user's device, which, which means taking resources away from the user. And so the user needs to be involved in that decision. But in many cases, you, you don't need that like, level of guarantee, and you can probably build pretty good heuristics uh, so that things like, mostly work without the user being involved. But I also think that we need, uh, in, in, we, we need to enable websites to say, hey, I really want to be able to guarantee this to the user, in which case, we, need, we can have an interaction, we can have a security dialogue. But as long as we make that flow nice and, and don't ask, like Firefox currently does, asks you like three times before, uh, before it, it, it grants you that, that permission, we should have like, it, it should be within the control of the website to, to ask when to ask the user, and it should only be one question. Like you, you should, the user should just say, yeah, I'm okay with giving this website a little bit more permission, so that, and that should be it. Right? Like we shouldn't need to ask about individual specifications. So, can I just do a quick poll? Who, who here has run out of space when they were building an offline app? You. So we have a few people who. Okay, interesting. 
Okay. And it's also a UX issue. Sorry, I don't mean yeah. to. There's, but there's like the, what is it that I'm doing here, right? Are we going to ask users honestly to go sort of reason about their storage independently of what the application is? I, I, I don't think that people, generally speaking, certainly not to the, the app platform models that we have today, uh, I don't think I don't think people reason about them independently. Like you have an application, and that means that you have its data as well. Um, and we don't really have a reified idea of what an application is. Right? That's the thing that we don't have as a as a unit of of something that we can communicate to end users today. And I, you know, Mozilla is building an app platform, and we're we're building an app platform, and they help unify that concept. Um, and it feels to me like helping to make that transition from I've got a page to look is also an application. I think that's really the big transition for uh, everyone who's building apps, um, both conceptually as you're building them and for users who are consuming them. Um, I'd like to talk more at some point about what it means to transition as a builder to thinking about an app. But so yeah. Well, your, your microphone's not working, so next time you want to speak, just let me know and I'll, uh, you can speak into, speak into mine. His mic works fine, but he can't talk over his shoulder to Andrew. He's got to talk directly to him. Anyways, uh, his mic. Sorry about that. So I think uh, part of the problem with the situation right now is that Web applications feel a little bit different than websites, but they're all running in the same universe. And when you're building an application, you want to have quite a bit of control over how you're storing your resources and managing the user data. Whereas historically, web APIs have been more like suggestions to the user agent. It's up to the user agent to interpret what's going on and deal with it appropriately. Uh, AppCache demonstrates that there's a lot of assumptions built into that that don't always work, and it makes it difficult to have a consistent experience. So I think part of the problem is actually philosophical. Like as we go forward and build a new API, it's uh, how how much control do we want to let these applications have, hmm. and uh, it's a trust issue as well. Going to a random website, how much trust does that actually imply that the user has? I, I don't. I, I think we could spend like the the whole of today sort of trying to work out what the difference between a website and a web app is, and I I think at the end of it we we'd say, well, does it actually matter? You know, what, what, you know, once we've made that decision, why, why, what, what would we do differently? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think this, this sort of API we're making now would work fine for sites uh, and, and work fine for apps. I mean, what, what, what do you see as the, as the difference between the two? Uh, probably persistence of storage and amount of storage. Like, those are, those are the characteristics. If you want a random website to be able to dump a gigabyte of, of data onto your well, hard drive. Well, I might if it's Wikipedia. I might, I might, well, I might want to download Wikipedia. It's a site. Yeah, I might too. But there's no good model for letting a user illustrate that that's actually what they really wanted. Yeah, I, think, I think one problem we, we have is that historically websites have been these things where you, you, we sort of, as, as a browser, we sort of treat them as we have no idea if this is something that the user actually likes. It might be just some random website that the user found uh, through a link in, an e in, a, in a spam email. And so we kind of like have this very distrusting relationship of the website. And, and as we're trying to expand the web uh, into being able to do more things, we have to sort of uh, enable the user to indicate, like, I actually trust this website. I actually enjoy this website. I want this website to, to be able to do things that and an attacker problem shouldn't be able to do. And so we need some way of some UX to uh, enable the user to communicate to the browser that, hey, uh, it's okay for this website to, to get some extra capabilities. Um, so it, one way of, of doing this is, is these app platforms that both Firefox and, uh, and, and Chrome OS is having, um, which uh, enables the user to go through this install flow at which point you sort of indicated that, yeah, I trust this, this uh, website enough that I have sort of installed it. Uh, we should enable that, those capabilities not just through install flow, but also through other means where it's still a website, UX-wise, but you, you sort of indicated some other way that, that it's OK for this guy um, to use more resources. The two things on, in Firefox OS that we're giving a, a website once it's installed is the ability to use resources and the ability to annoy the user. So with, 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 uh, on the web, we've, you know, we build pop-up blockers. We try to disable this ability of, of disabling the context menu. And, and a lot of these things that it's really nice if the good guys can do, but we don't want the bad guys to do. And, and so if we, if we can have some way to use UX to indicate that this website should be able to do these things, then we can enable much more full applications. Do you think that using app runtimes as a solution to offline problems is is good enough, or 
do you think that we should, you ought to be able to solve these problems without using app runtime? Uh, I think app runtime is a good way for us to experiment, uh, but I think it, it's, it's sort of an easy out. Like we know we have, we have this traditional sort of sense of what an application is, and, and uh, it, it's traditional users sort of uh, know what it means to install an application as far as like. I know that this enables this application to do more things than and think, like I shouldn't install it if I, if I need it. Um, so it, it gives us an easy out, but it's, I think it's definitely not good enough. We need to, it needs to be sort of a, a fluid transition from being a, a potentially evil spam website that the user has navigated to, to being a fully trusted installed app. Like there's, it's a smooth transition and the user should ask you're slowly sort of getting more and more familiar with the website. It, it, it shouldn't be a, a hard cut, it should be as a, like you trust it more and more and it gets more and more capabilities as the user gives you more and more trust. So definitely app, app runtime is definitely not an app of an answer. Yeah, we've, we've been through that same problem before with with Flash, I mean, we went for it so long with not adding these APIs into HTML, saying, oh, if you want those kind of capabilities, do it in a plugin. And we're seeing the same again with, oh, just if you want those kind of things, just do it in an app. And we shouldn't let that stop us making the platform better. So Jake and Alex, you, you're proposing effectively a, a controller um, that gives the developer a lot more flexibility over how they respond to offline situations. Um, there's a great question, moderator, which is how how would you um, propose to use that to handle the one-legged dog scenario? So um, I think the the answer to this is that um, I'll, it's a little bit circuitous, so stick with me. Um, the way AppCache works, generally speaking, when it works, is to help you take the shell of an application, the thing that will load content and then display it to you while you're offline, package that up and make it available to you at all points, right? What Jake showed you was a great way for you to package up the shell of a content application using app cache. Um, there's a related question, but which is conflated by the API of app cache, unfortunately, which is how do I then deal with the content that I'm loading inside this shell, right? Because every, every app you load in a native environment has this duality. I've got shell and I've got a, a library of content that I'm navigating. And if you think about the way you're building things on the server, you do exactly the same thing. You've got this node graph of content that you are allowing users to transition through, and they're all mapped to URLs. But you usually take the little bit of content that's unique to that URL, and you smash a gigantic template thing around it, and you spit it all out as a string, and then you rehydrate it on the client side. Um, but that isn't what the URL is really addressing. The URL addresses that little bit of content, that unique bit of indis indivisible content that you're serving at that URL. And it may be multiple nodes all joined into one particular um, serialization, but that's sort of the idea. Um, so the question is, how do we enable people to build application architectures offline, which easily give you that shell and the ability to cache resources, which you will load inside that shell, so that you can discover them, so you can load them, you can provide a fallback experience if you don't have them. Today, app cache rolls them all into one manifest, because today, if you actually take the app cache model to its logical conclusion, what you realize at the end of this long, painful journey, which Jake took and which the Gmail team took, and which a lot of people who have been building offline apps have taken independently, is that app cache is the thing that you use to cache the shell. And for all other content, which you would have liked to have given a nice URL, what you do is you build an ad hoc synchronization protocol, you put it in WebSQL database or IndexedDB, your local storage, and then every time someone navigates to that URL, you try to override what the browser was gonna do to navigate you, go get it out of the local storage if you have it, and then perform your own synchronization on that data model. So you have a data model which is not represented at those URLs anymore. So the, the default model is effectively URL hostile. And the only thing that's helped by having it at a URL is loading the initial shell, which is the least meaningful thing uh, in terms of URL space, right? So what you'd really like to do in all of this is to help application authors understand through the API that you're caching two separate sets of things. There's a shell, which is your browser for your content, right? There's the browser that you browse to different sites and apps with, but there's the, the browser that you build for the content that you're surfacing inside your app, and then there's the content of the app. You need to treat them independently, but you'd like them both to be cacheable as HTTP resources. So the way to get there is to sort of change expectations. There's no app that you're going to build that's meaningful that's not offline by default. App Cache gets you part of the way there because it makes the resources for your app shell offline by default. But it doesn't necessarily do anything particular for the resources that you would like to load inside that shell. So 
that we have to make this transition in thinking about building apps in this world, which is we're not building a p series of HTML pages that you're going to serialize at a URL with you know, fully formed uh, from the server side as strings that you're going to put back into the cache. It's nonsensical. It doesn't work. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to assume that there's a shell that's booted and you're moving between the cached resources. And if you can get to them, the uncached ones. right? And that means that you're always working from this local store of your shell and your content in order to do everything. And that's the big transition that has sort of been conflated with the, the use of app cache over time. Um, and everyone discovers that that's what app cache sort of implies. But it doesn't really, it's not clear. And it's not clear that that's how you have to build your application to be successful. So I haven't I would seen the model working in, in, if it was like a, if you imagine an app, I think I'm all right. If you imagine an app where it's, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you imagine an app where it's like a series of, of messages from people you're subscribed to, which you know, basically, basically Twitter, um, if you visit the page and you don't have a controller installed, you don't have JavaScript, the server is going to construct all of the, the stuff. You're going to have to wait for a network response, and you'll get it. You know how we kind of how the internet should work today. If you have a controller installed, it's going to uh, respond with just a kind of empty content shell of the UI. It's going to kick off a, an XHR request on your page, but you know it's going to have a header or a, some, a query string saying, "I'm okay with cached data." The controller is going to see that and return the last data you saw. And you're going to build up the page, and that's going to happen instantly. But then it will set off another XHR saying with something in a query string saying, "I want this data to come from online," and that connection will either succeed, in which case you'll replace the content on the screen with the new stuff. Or it will fail, and you'll fail silently, and that's your offline experience. You know, that, can I just pick up on we, we were talking about um, the sort of failure scenario of, of trying to load content and then it failing and falling back to content from cache. So the, 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 I mean, the biggest problem we have with app cache with the fallback is that you can't control that timeout, right? You can't you can't determine how long that's going to be, and it's usually longer than a user is prepared to wait. So in the scenario of using navigation controller, would you be able to configure what that timeout is? How long well, are you yeah, prepared to wait? You have explicit control. You have explicit control under the controller scenario over the loading process. So you are able to make a decision um, when you're dispatching the request in the first place. Do I know that I'm offline? The only thing that we can actually tell you from the browser's perspective about your online versus offline state is that you are definitively not connected to any network. We can't tell you whether or not you can hit your server. We can't tell you anything about what's reasonable in terms of expectation for hitting your server. We can tell you if you're behind a hostile proxy or inside of a captive portal any, uh, from some Wi-Fi thing. We can't tell you any of that. That's going to be up to your application to sort of have to figure out. And the way you do that is by making one of these requests and then watching what happens. So um, yes, you'll be able to you know, cancel the, the request and respond with, I have no idea what's going on. Um, and it's going to be explicitly under your control uh, which is to say that you'll explicitly have to provide that functionality, but that's a sort of a damn sight better than trying to have to figure out a way to make AppCache do it right now. And here's, an, here's another question from moderator. Is there scope for a standard way of synchronizing content from server to client and vice versa? <laughs> And so synchronization is really hard. Uh, I mean, once you get into two-way synchronization, which is what you often get into, is is essentially like there's there's no standard way of synchronizing data. Like it's very very application specific how you deal with um, with with merge conflicts. Um, what there so so one one answer is simply no. There, there we we can't solve this. Um, there are some some interesting approaches that may work. So couch, for example does this thing where it allows you to synchronize data, but it doesn't actually deal with the merging. So you can pull down data, and you, uh, the local data that you end up with is, uh, is explicitly contains the conflict. And then after the fact, uh, once you run, run code, then you can, can deal with that conflict. And, and so potentially, we can build something around that model. Uh, but I, I think it's dealing with synchronization is really, really hard. I think in the beginning, we, we need to just are we just, are we just asking for trouble here? I mean, are we just asking to build something that developers will say, that doesn't quite work the way I want it to, so I'm going to build my own? I, I think the thing that will, will get you in trouble is making assumptions about the, the developer's data model, which we're not collaborative. So if we provide developers a data model, um, which you know, we constrain tightly, like if we provide a straight transition chart system that you can then speak uh, in high-level terms about the 
changes between the states of your applications, and then we can watch those in the way that, say, um, a SQL database watches the SQL queries that come in and the transactions and the commits, and then you can then make a binary log of them. Then you can start to do something about the synchronization of the high-level application semantics. But we don't have that high-level, uh, as much as people would like to pretend that HTML is semantic, it ain't. Right? HTML today, in most of its use cases, ain't semantic. You're not saying anything more meaningful than div, 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 div. Um, and your mutations of HTML are no more meaningful than show or hide this particular piece of UI. They don't relate specifically, in most cases, except in a tangential way, to I'm changing this particular piece of state in my data model, right? Which is what you're trying to synchronize. And so we don't have a local idea of a data model. Therefore, we can't really cons up the idea of a local synchronization store. I think that the next iteration of the library wars will be about data models locally and synchronization. My guess is that people are going to start doing operational transform libraries out of the woodwork. It's going to be amazing. We're starting to see this a little bit with Meteor um, and some other libraries that are starting to sort of apply some good computer science to the question of how do I differentiate what's happening when I change it? How do I prevent merge conflicts in the first place by dealing in high-level operations and not in, oh, look, some field was added or removed. And we're starting to add good support for being able to build these libraries into both the language and the DOM through something called object.observe and mutation observers, which are a way of observing those changes as they happen and responding to high level events and not the low level primitives changing out from underneath you. But we've got a very long way collectively to go to get to an agreement whereby we as browser vendors would feel, I think, reasonably comfortable in blessing one particular strategy for describing your data, and then another strategy for synchronizing it. So has anyone here implemented any kind of offline sync, any kind of ability to synchronize data to the browser? Yeah. OK. So w what's your use case? What? So me? Yeah. Um, it's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It's exactly um, how you've just um, described it. The app cache hosts the shell, and everything else comes from local storage. So local storage um, is the user data. App cache is the shell. And it assumes from the beginning that the user is going to have no data and then tries to fetch over a, an, ex a, a, an AJAX request and feeds into local storage. Cool. I think most of the problems with synchronization are less data model than we would think. I, I feel like it's actually a feasible uh, problem. If you look at stuff like iCloud, you can offer a couple of pretty basic data strategies, like I've got a key value store or I have a record store. You don't need to build up particularly complex models in, in the browser to actually be able to support, like, there's this thing, it has a GUID, and you know, you can say whatever the most recent changed version is works. The, the que so you're, you're positing that one default strategy across multi-tenant multi synchronization will work, that there's only a single user, and that user's last change is going to be synchronized in time correctly well, across of, multiple systems. And you're set saying that there's a closed form over the operations that I can take. You do need the closed form, but you need the ability for applications to specify the operations that they will allow on their data and what it means for them to change a piece of data. Um, yes, you can, you can bring users down to one model of mutating data and what that semantic is for mutation. Um, and you can constrain the set of things that they will then reasonably be able to do in their app without hitting synchronization issues based on this policy. You could do that, but I don't feel like um, it's our job as a platform right now to make that kind of a call uh, in quite such a closed way, because I don't think that we've got the experience in our community for that's the right thing to do. I can tell you right now that that would not work for Gmail. It honestly would not work for Gmail. It wouldn't work for Sync. It wouldn't have worked for Wave. It doesn't work for Plus. Won't, won't fly. Mark, can you tell us why Twitter doesn't currently use offline? Well, Twitter's uh, web platform is in a bit of flux. Um, we're moving towards a server as the ultimate source of truth. So we actually don't do any client-side rendering at all. Um, so any navigation event, even though it's like happening Ajaxly, is actually just injecting a response from the server. So you can't really cache that nearly as efficiently as you could like a series of JSON responses, for example, because they're full, full page responses. So not every um, Ajax model is going to work as well with that sort of a strategy. Um, whether that changes in the future, TBD, but you have 
basically two competing styles of how you want to have a fast responsive app. You have something that like lives on the server, you have something that lives entirely on the client, and having something that can react to both is actually sort of a messy, terrible proposition right now. I guess in Twitter. The, the way we did that at is, oh, yeah. Yeah. The way we did that at Lanyard was we, we had um, we were rendering on the server with uh, with mustache and some data. And then when we were doing the same on the client with offline, we were using the same mustache templates and we were caching the, the same data model in, in local storage, the same, the same as you were. And obviously we'd rather be doing that in, in app cache. So uh, yeah, you can still do the sort of, you know, the progressive enhancement thing and have a kind of client-based app that is, that, and you're not duplicating too much data. I don't know, if, uh, did you ever see the, the um, Airbnb article uh, recently where they um, were talking about, hey, we've, you know, we've, we've decided to try this new exciting idea and what we're gonna do is we're gonna render content on the server and we're going to send out an HTML string of content, and it's amazingly fast. You guys should all be doing this. And it's, oh, it's brilliant. yeah, that's yeah, you know, yeah. We've been calling that progressive enhancement, you know. Well, that was sort of our model too. We we had Twitter kind of famously remember the Hashbang website a couple of years ago. It was actually pretty speedy if you were on a MacBook Pro with the latest version of Chrome. But if you were using IE7 in Bangalore, it was actually an atrocious experience. And so the server-side model ends up working a lot better on the low end. And the problem with having um, two, two rendering stacks, even if they're sharing templates, is that you've got quirks between nice. your, your view implementations. And that is a great way to kill yourself with a thousand paper cuts, yeah. especially if you're on a large dev team with a few dozen developers trying to keep it all in sync. Yeah, no, I, 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 I completely agree with that, because we, we were using Mustache, and we ended up pretty much sort of owning or you know, ma making massive contributions to about four different Im implementations of Mustache, the Python one, the Java one, the iOS one, and the JavaScript one, uh, yeah, so. Uh, so there's one developer at Twitter who's single-handedly written two from scratch, Hogan <laughs> and Eckersley, just because most of the implementations had some sort of issue. So are we saying then that, that the only real use case for offline technologies is when you actually want to build an offline app rather than to improve the performance of your app? Well application versus website. It's the same sort of uh, thing I mentioned earlier. I feel like the offline technologies are really good for building like an app, like the lanyard thing, but they don't really map very well towards a Twitter or like even the Wikipedia kind of example. They just don't feel like a very good fit for something where you're always pulling in new data and it's an unbounded amount of content that you might want to pull in. If you're just looking to improve performance, that's what the HTTP cache is for. The application cache is for caching application. You know, it's, it's for is, is, is for making it work offline. Um, if you can get a performance benefit out of using it, then fair enough, but you are buying into making an offline first experience. Uh -huh. To be clear though, the, the, the new proposal would be a reasonable accelerator, right? If, if you don't ever handle any navigation events but only resources, um, you could certainly build that local, a local high performance cache um, system to improve website performance without, without biting off any offline capability at all. And what, in what situation would you want to do that versus using the, the HTTP cache? Uh, we've had, we've had uh, good input from the folks at Facebook that this is their core use case uh, for app cache is actually making things, or not a core, one of their most important use cases was uh, making things available um, faster, right? And, you know, at Google, you know, I, I know that our mobile teams have had similar, similar uh, needs and app cache hasn't met them. So hopefully it, this new API will meet those two. Yeah, I think I think the model that, that the mental model that I've had recently is that um, it, uh, it it would be great if we can make it work so that the online case is very similar to the offline case. Uh, it, it's more a, a difference between you are using controller slash app cache uh, or you're not. So if if we can make it so that when when you are using these new features f uh, for enabling offline, but you happen to be online. You can still you can still download the data uh, and and just download the the data part and not the the template and the static content, and and use the cached version of that to increase performance. I I'm definitely hoping that that is uh, that that is a model we can get to to basically make the online application experience be more competitive with with native. Where on on native you're you're downloading your your shell once and then as you're using it you're just downloading the incremental data. Uh, we, we should be able to make the same thing possible on the web to increase performance. So the, the, the HTTP cache is like the, you know, this really busy room and, and everyone's in there and, and so the browser's having to sort of be the bouncer at the door and you know, when, when other people want 
into the room. The the bouncer sort of going in and going, look, you've you've had you've had enough, you've had too much to drink. You should get out. <laughs> and then so what Facebook have done is gone. Ah, but there's this quieter bar around the corner. Uh, we're going to go there. But the thing is, like, if everyone starts doing that, then that bar is going to have to hire a bouncer, and they're going to start kicking people out as well. It's a kind of it, it seems like a nice performance enhancement now, but I think if everyone started using it, we're going to get the same issues. But if if everyone's stuffing fonts and images into local storage. Uh, there's going to have to be a bouncer there that starts that kicks people out, unless people start uh, the website asks for a permanent cache. But I don't think we want a web where you know you just visit Facebook because you want to look at a thing and it's saying Facebook wants to install five megabytes worth of stuff just just so you can see it. You know, it's not not for an offline experience. It's just to look at the site. So the interesting characteristic about using App Cache for storing the outer shell is that it lets you have a cache where it's totally happy to start rendering the page with the old version without even going to see if there's a new one. And that's something that HTTP caching could, could theoretically be modified to have, um, but doesn't. And it's an interesting characteristic all of its own. Um, HTTP caching in general is uh, best described as bewildering. Um, there's just so many options, and it never quite does what you expect. And uh, with all of AppCache's problems, one thing that we can say is at least we can expect that the data will be there when we ask for it again. I think that uh, I don't think it's a it's a I don't think the bar around the corner is necessarily going to get as as packed as the the initial HTTP cache bar uh, because um, if we apply if we're good enough at building the heuristics where maybe we don't download the app cache the first time you visit a website but if we see that you visit a website every day then we'll we'll download the app cache and we'll we'll keep it more tightly. Uh, so I think we can, if we're, if we're clever about, more clever than we are with, with HTTP cache, uh, then I, I think we can, we can keep, and keep the good people in that bar. Why, why do we need a, another bar at all? I mean, just hypothetically, why do we not just have a, an extra cache control directive that gives enhanced persistence within the HTTP cache? Uh, I, I sort of try to rephrase this as, why is there no priority system, right? Why is there no user expressible and collaborative priority system, right? So many of the the cases where we wind up fighting the browser as developers are cases where if we could express our intent more clearly to the browser, the browser could collaborate with the user to have a better experience provided in many cases, right? We could then use the browser to help express to the user, hey, this is what we're trying to do here, right? And if you say to the, to the browser, listen, these resources are really dear to me, these are slightly less dear, and these are even, um, uh, these are totally ephemeral, I don't really need them, you know, the, the work that, um, the folks of doing on uh, cache manifest, uh, sorry, um, uh, quota API for the file system um, sort of points in this direction where you're getting to a point where you can start to collaborate with a system and say, listen, these are really important to me, these are less important. And I don't think we need to back ourselves into hard guarantees as long as we're, we're able to say that by default, you're in the less privileged group um, until you ask for privilege, right? In which case you, you take on some responsibility to collaborate, right? You might be evicted. You might get events about whether or not eviction is about to happen. And maybe you should offer up some other thing to remove or try to remove stuff for yourself. I mean, this is sort of a well-worn path in a lot of other operating systems where you'll, you'll say, hey, dear plugin or dear application, you know, we're running low on storage. Can you please clean some stuff up? Um, or where, where the, the OS tries to clean things up for you if it winds up under pressure. At that point, you have to have a conversation. And if today, we have no way to have that conversation. So it's not that we need necessarily need a different bar or a different bouncer, but I think those are just sort of like one way of saying we need multiple levels of collaboration and cooperation, and we don't have any of that right now. This kind of goes to the philosophical web idea of the user agent knows best. Even when we talk about some of the new ideas, there's these heuristics on caching, and we're not We've never really decided to empower the app developer to have much of a say in this. Well, let's be clear. The user agent is in control. It may not know best, but it's certainly in control because we're putting users in control of their, their system and their experience. So the, the imperative for the user agent to have the last say is all about giving users the last say. And so that's an inviolable principle of a safe web. Um, you know, the answer was, well, shouldn't we just count on everyone being nice? And the answer is no, advertisers. Um, Duh. <laughs> it's, a, it's still a very different model than native apps, though. And I'm not saying it's a, bad, it's a bad model, but it's just interesting that native apps don't have the same set of constraints on them. Once they're on the app, then they can do all of these things within the sandbox. And in general, the sandbox that you'll get on a native platform is very, um, very much wider than the sandbox that you'll get as a random website. Yeah, but uh, we, we do, there's still a, a very big difference from a random website and a native app. Like uh, With a native app, the user has made a decision that I, I care about this app 
I mean, at the very least, enough to like bother with the download time, right? But e even to the point, like it's it's even more to the point that like the user has said, I trust this website uh, to to do a lot of things. Like it, most native apps can take over your system, right? So the user has clearly indicated that there's some amount of trust, and and so we can't really ever give like the random website that the user is visiting the first time the same amount of trust as, as a native app has. But it, it's something. This is where I think this, this smooth transition from going from untrusted to trusted needs to happen. Um, yeah. Is it ever reasonable that you could, you could visit a random website and it could prompt you saying, this website wants to completely take over your computer, do you want to allow this? Sure, we have that today, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think we can have, I don't think we should have the, uh, uh, the question to the user, click the yes button if you want your system entirely taken over, click the no button if not, because the ra some people will click the yes button not knowing what they're doing. So. It, it, we need to be more careful than that. Um. I like to think about this as, um, uh, what are you getting back for friction? So in native app, apps, there's much more friction to discovery and use, right? I have to go know that I want it, or be told that I want it, or be advertised to that it is something I should want, uh, and then go bite off the friction of, of finding this thing. Whereas the web has this amazing model where there's a zero friction to, to navigate and use a new thing. I mean, you know, identity is a problem. We, we've got a lot of other things which add incidental friction over time. But generally speaking, like, we have paid application developers back a thousand fold for, you know, putting something on the web by reducing the friction to using it to, to almost nothing. And native app models induce this friction. And I think that Jonas is entirely correct that that smooth transition needs to get you to a point where in order to get the same capabilities that you would give to a native app, you have to have the same level of friction because there is the, the constraints that you impose in, at those points are reasonable and both sets of system authors have made choices about which constraints you're gonna impose at uh, each level of friction you know, under all the same considerations, right? They're saying if you browse to a, sort of an ephemeral web page, then you get whatever level of effort you know you put into browsing there, and if you install something, well, you get maybe you know more privilege and, and more process available to you. Um, and I think that's that's the right model. And and so yeah, I think that's going to be the the end point is we'll we'll have that much friction, and having that much friction will get you that much. The smooth gradient is a really interesting model, but I, I just think that like as we're designing new APIs, we should make sure that we actually try to figure out like what does that smooth gradient look like, and how can we make the APIs flexible enough to to have a difference between it's either working completely or it doesn't work. Or okay. I think um, we should probably move on and talk about what we can do today rather than what we should be doing tomorrow. So um, one of the most popular questions we have is uh, a lot of people are stuffing fonts, images, and JavaScript in local storage for faster loading. Should we be discouraging this? Um, which is uh, something we've made of contention between Ilya Gregoric and, uh, and us as well. So. Um, what would you say to that, Alex? Is it working for you? If so, go for it. <laughs> I mean, I come from a dirty JavaScript hacker background, right, man? If it works, run. Run with it as far as it goes, but measure, 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 measure. If it's actually faster, heck yes. Make the web faster. Go. Do it. So do we need to be aware of, of what pain that's storing up for us in future? And how much pain is that storing up for us in future? A lot. So there, l l let me... <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. Uh, so um, you'll notice if you're stuffing a lot of stuff into local storage that you'll see some really strange behavioral differences between IE9 and 10 and Firefox and Chrome with regards to um, potentially getting out of sync across tabs or across windows with regards to trying to communicate over local storage. Well, why is that? Local storage is a synchronous API. This is, generally speaking, in terms of web API design, a terrible, terrible thing. This is a bad thing. It's the reason that IndexedDB is coming along, um, which is available, I think, in IE10, and it's available in Chrome, and is coming along in other places, too. Another terrible, terrible thing. Another, it's it's hard to, harder to use, right? Um, so that was the pain. So that pain uh, generated this new uh, system, which isn't widely, de widely enough deployed yet. Um, and so uh, folks find out that there's an implicit cross-tab synchronization issue with local storage because the API is synchronous for all the tabs that can see the same local store. Uh, this isn't great. This is actually relatively terrible. So we need an asynchronous version of local storage. So one of the things you're biting off is a huge performance issue because you'll start loading your web page. You'll ask local storage early in the document load to go grab you some resource, and you think it's fast, except 
we're brand new to this, right? We might have put this in a SQLite database on a per local store or per origin basis. We have to go do synchronous I.O. to go load that database, block the web page, by the way, while we're doing this, block the main thread, go do a bunch of I.O., and then give you the answer, right? This okay. is terrible for performance. Okay, so I get, I get it. It's painful. So should we just not do it and wait for this amazing navigation controller to appear? No, you should, you should measure. You should measure, measure, measure. And once you've measured, you'll have an answer about whether or not it's better or worse. But you won't until you measure. So um, lo local storage is, is, is uh, so the, there's, there's, I think there's two separate questions here. Uh, taking resources and storing them locally on, on the client side is, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good workaround to do until we get things like a, a, this controller thing, until we fix the app cache, and, and like, until we get other mechanisms in place that actually make it a pleasurable experience to, to develop these solutions. Um, the other, the other uh, problem is that, but, but, well, so the, the, the local storage issue of being a synchronous API, it's actually, please do measure it, but it's actually really, really hard to measure. The, the problem is that what a lot of um, this synchronous I.O., which uh, A, is very, very dependent on the device. You can't measure it locally. You need to measure it on, on, like, on your user's devices. The other problem is that uh, it's, it's, very, it's, not, it's not a performance hit that happens every time you use local storage. It happens probably the first time you use it. Uh, and even just like calling, we, ha we have had some benchmarks that the first thing it does, it calls local storage.clear, and then it starts using local storage. But at the time you call the local storage that's clear, that's actually when the performance hit happens. Local storage, I would say, is hard enough to measure performance of that you probably will not get it right. What we're doing in Firefox at 22, 21 or something is we're actually going to preload local storage before we're even running scripts. So that performance hit is not something you can't even measure. And, and we're, the reason we're doing that is because hopefully in that, those cases we can do this I.O. before you're even attempting to use it. Um, it does have the, the effect that um, we're going to do, do more I.O. for each and every website, or each and every page on your website if, as soon as you use local storage. But that's, a, a, that's to avoid this like halting, every, halting the thread and, and having your site lock up while you're doing this I.O. Uh, so local storage's performance is really, really tricky. So um, IndexedDB um, has issues. Those are in big part my fault. I'm one of the, the editors for that spec. Um, we do need a, something like asynchronous local storage, which is as simple as local storage, but doesn't have the synchronous uh, problem. So that, that hopefully will come soon. I'm hopeful for that too. OK. Um, so in the meantime, do you think that the fact that developers love local storage and don't like APIs like IndexedDB is an indication that um, you know, we need to simplify IndexedDB and WebSQL and, and those sort of APIs. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so um, one of the things that I've been working on over the last couple of months is to add a, uh, a futures primitive. So you might have promises in your libraries. Just, we're just going to ignore the, the fight over what it means to have a promise. We're going to call it a future. It's a different thing. Same API. Dot then, and you can add whatever callbacks you want to uh, success and, and failure. Accept and reject. OK, cool. So. We're building a spec for futures for DOM, so we can start to reinterpret a lot of these, these asynchronous things in a more unified way, because events aren't really the right model for something that is a single res request. Like, if I get one thing out of local storage, I'm only asking for one thing back. I'm not asking for a potential stream of things to happen you know, zero or more times in the future, which is the event model. So um, I have hope that we'll be able to build uh, a saner version of a lot of these APIs to stop using events and stop using implicit um, asynchronousity asynchronicity and end of turn behavior um, and make it much more explicit in the APIs. Do an asynchronous uh, local storage on top of something like this. And then, you know, I, Web Crypto and IndexedDB, you know, I think these, these, all these APIs can be retrofitted with this model so that we get a much more rational API. I think a lot of this is down to you know, the APIs not really having great idioms baked into them. And it's one of these traditional like DOM versus the rest of the JavaScript world discussions, which I'm happy to talk to you about over beer endlessly. So how long until we get navigation controller? Someone else has a microphone. I'm not <laughs> taking responsibility for that. Yeah, so, so the, the, the space of uh, sort of fixing the app cache where, where navigation controller is a, is a very interesting uh, proposal um, is something that for some reason have been, 
we've had a very, very hard time actually getting to the point of having proposals. I would say we've been working on this for well over a year and a half, uh, probably two years, on just like people ranting about how much app cache sucks, and, but there has not been any proposals. There are now two proposals. There's the controller thing. Mozilla also has a proposal uh, that we're uh, hopefully going to present very soon. Um, where, uh, and I think that's an enormously good first step. What we need to do uh, once we have these proposals is to uh, get feedback from everyone that has been complaining about app cache. Is, are these two proposals, are they actually, they're actually, the two proposals are actually very complementary, so they actually combine very well. Um, are, is, if you had these two things, would that solve your problems? Or would this just be a less sucky way um, so we have a very good first step. Um, I, it'll take a little bit to get this stuff implemented, but I think it'll take a lot less than the, the like well over a year that we've been complaining about AppCache. So the, on the, the sort of simple APIs, you know, do we, do we build something sort of really low level and, and you know, maybe a bit more complicated to deal with, or do we just try and go as simple as possible? Uh, you, we want something as simple as possible, but we oh, look what happened to AppCache, you know, they made something that's really, really simple, but they didn't know what people really wanted to do with it, so they made something simple and useless. And, and, this is, so I, and whereas with uh, local storage, that, um, that was simple and easy to use, but had massive performance uh, problems. So I kind of like the world where you might have something like IndexedDB, where it's the, you know, what you can do with it, there's, there's loads you can do with it, but then have a look at what the use cases are, see what code, you see people repeating over and over, what, what are people using libraries for, and how can we get that into, into the platform? You see that happening with the DOM now, you know, with query selector all was one of those things. You know, we see jQuery doing it, we can make jQuery faster by having that on the, on the platform, and people maybe wouldn't have to use jQuery if, if, if that's the case. So that's kind of what I see with the, going with the navigation controller. Some of the code that I showed uh, on there was stuff I kind of made up, like there was a routing function, which is something that probably won't be there in the initial spec, but it's something you can create yourself, or something a library can produce, uh, can, can give you. And you know, we'll be able to sort of see what people are doing, and if there's like common patterns or a lot of repeated code, then we can put that in the platform, make it quicker, uh, and, and make it less typing. Yeah, we can trust that libraries will come into existence. It's something we can rely on on the web. So we should build for flexibility instead of like stupid simplicity. Great. Well, we're out of time, so thanks everyone, and that's the end of the panel.